said, again, welcome to everybody. And David, please take it away. Thank you, Carl. Welcome, everyone. We left off yesterday having our students playing in cut time without them even realizing that that's what they were doing. Once students are playing etudes and songs written in 4-4, but they're actually playing them in cut time simply because their teacher has said to them, let's give the whole notes two counts. They can then be asked to turn to the actual cut time section of any beginning lesson book. I mean, they're already doing cut time, right? Why not? I guarantee you that if students are introduced to rhythmic notation in the way that it was introduced to you yesterday, they will sight read the cut time unit of any beginning book, band, orchestra, choir, piano, guitar, recorder, kazoo, whatever. How can I possibly say that with such uh, absolute degree of certainty? It is simply because whoever wrote the book for beginners with a cut time unit in it erroneously thought that they were introducing cut time to your students. They had no way of knowing that your students have already mastered cut time, although the students may not even know it yet. They're just doing it. Your introduction to your students to the cut time section of their book will take you about 30 seconds. And the students will be enjoying cut time with no confusion at all. Here is your 30 second long introduction to cut time for your students. Girls and boys, ladies and gentlemen, do you see that letter C with the straight line down through it where the time signature usually goes? That C with the line drawn down through it is a different kind of time signature. It's not numbers. It is a close relative of the other known number time signature that you may already know about. And common time is 4-4 four, four time, and that C stands for common time. Makes sense, doesn't it? I'll be explaining more about the new name, cut time, sometime later. But for now, all you need to know is that it simply means that for the music, on the next few pages in your book, the whole notes are going to be two counts. That's it, two counts, and that's all you need to know for right now. I will not be reminding you that the whole notes are two counts when you see that new sign that we call cut time, the one with the line drawn down through the C. That's now your job. When you see that new time signature, you just tell yourselves that the whole notes are two counts. And you've already been doing that, so it's no big deal, right? You have one thing to concentrate on. That new sign means that the whole notes are two counts. That's all there is to it. Let's play the first page of the cut time unit book. And that's the end of the 30 second long cut time lesson, folks. The whole notes are two counts, done. Yes, of course, there will be much important discussion and learning about cut time to follow, but it will be done concentrating on one step at a time with each separate brick being placed on top of the solid foundation that cut time that has already been laid. We are not going to tell our students the whole cut time story right now. For now, they have the luxury of concentrating only on the fact that whole notes are two counts. As I said, done. The students will easily sight read the first page of the book's cut time unit, and they will be happy and proud of themselves as well they should be. They are going to like this cut time stuff. How can I predict that kind of success? Here's how. The person who wrote the book thought that most of the things on the beginning pages of their cut time unit were going to be new to your students. And so the etudes and songs and exercises were purposely made to be very, very simple. I am absolutely biased about all of this and have obviously not been trying to hide it from you as I'm sure you've noticed. Why? because it is all based on the way the system was designed and therefore the students understand how rhythm really works. When they see a new piece of music, their attitude of rhythmic self-esteem tells them, I can figure this out myself, thank you. I will not have to wait until my teacher sings it for me or tells me how it goes. Ladies and gentlemen, I am convinced that that kind of attitude is the reason that the question, how's this go, vanished from my classroom without me even realizing it. 
Students approached rhythm reading with an I can do it myself attitude. Henry Ford, who was certainly an outside the box kind of thinker, his ideas about the factory assembly line changed manufacturing forever throughout the world. He said, and I really like this, Henry Ford said, if you think you can, or if you think you can't, you're right. If you think you can, or if you think you can't, you're right. Student attitude is so important in all of education. By this time, my young students completely understood how rhythmic notation works from the ground up or more accurately, I guess I should say from the whole note down. But I still had one major problem to solve. It was always me verbally telling my students how long the whole notes were. Somehow I had to teach them how to figure out the whole note values on their own. And I knew I had to do that the easiest way possible. In other words, I had to teach them how to solve for X, which is music's whole note value. And knowing the value of the whole note is imperative. If there is no whole note value, then there are no note values for any notes. Our system of rhythmic notation is not a system of set numbers attached to note symbols. It is a system of proportions. It was never intended that half notes are two counts. The only thing that we can say about a half note that will always be true is that it is half the value of the whole note. And that is why it is imperative that students can easily figure out the value of the whole note. Figuring out which kind of note gets one count is confusing and almost a waste of time. As you will see, finding the value of X, the whole note, can also be confusing or it can be super easy. And please remember, I did not use the term algebra with these young students. I did use it with my seventh and eighth graders after they started their introduction to basic algebra class, and I had fun with it. I told them, when you go to your algebra class today, you tell Mr. Howell that you get the day off. You've already done algebra today. No more algebra today, Mr. Howell. And when he asks you where you did algebra already today, you just tell him in band. Ladies and gentlemen, I see no harm at all in us letting our compatriots on the academic side of the education coin know that we are not the entertainment wing of the building. We also teach the academics, the academics of music. Rhythm is mathematics, principally algebra and the division of fractions. Intonation is the science of acoustics. Musical terms are, musical terms are languages, often foreign languages. Accelerando, andante, finissimo, fine, and so on. And I had my students say those words with the accent. I, I told them, you know that word you see at the end of the song, fine? The composer didn't put it there, there because he knows you did a fine job on the concert. He wasn't there. It's not fine. It's fine. It's Italian. It means the finish. Musical sounds are science. The longer the instrument, the lower the pitch. And the pitches themselves being sine waves are science. And we'll discuss later today, there is anecdotal evidence that music students seriously enjoy learning music's academics, music science. I repeat, music is both an art and a science. And as I said yesterday, we would all do well to give more thought and time to the academic part of music than we do in order to give our students a full, rich education in music. There is much that we need to do with our students in addition to singing and playing. I personally discovered that the more our students know about the science of our art form, the better they will sing and play the more creative their concerts will be. It does wonders. What they know about the science of music is terribly important, and I think it's too ignored. So back to the students figuring out the whole note values by themselves. By the way, before I forget it, there is a terrific, relatively new group on Facebook named the Middle School Band Directors Group. It is really active. A week or so ago, there was an interesting thread about how various members of the group teach time signatures. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. I highly recommend this very active group. It's a Facebook group. 
school, the middle school band directors group. After I figured out the easiest way possible to help students discover the whole note values on their own in a piece of music, I simply asked them one day, would you kids like to know how composers tell you how long the whole notes are? They said, yeah. Okay, listen carefully because I am gonna stop telling you the value of the whole note. It's always been me telling you the value of the whole notes, right? Well, starting today, it's your job, not mine. The value of the whole note is simply the bottom number of the time signature. Let me repeat that. The value of the whole note is simply the bottom number of the time signature. All you have to do is look at the bottom number of the time signature, and that will be the way the composer is telling you how long the whole note is in that piece of music. It's like a secret code being sent directly to you from the composer. Four, four means that there are four counts in a measure. That's the top number. That's what the top number has always told you, right? But the bottom number tells you something different. The bottom number says in 4-4 four, four that the whole note is four counts. Yes, I know. You most likely learned that the bottom number stands for the kind of note that gets one count, and that is still true. It's just that this new way that I'm going to tell you about is so much easier to understand. Once again, the bottom number tells you how long the whole note is. Therefore, the bottom number in the time signature of 4-4 is telling you that the whole note is four counts. So it's whole, half, quarter, four, two, one. Notice their beloved quarter notes are still one count in 4-4 time, people. But now they know exactly why they're one count. And it is so easy to understand. It's not something they need to memorize. It's something they can easily analyze. Whole, half, quarter, four, two, one. And that is the key to understanding. And understanding is the key to student competence. In simple 8-8, eight, eight, it's whole half quarter eighth, eight, four, two, one. The one count notes are still the same as in the centuries old definition of the bottom number of a time signature like 8-8. Eight, eight. But now they understand why eighth notes are one count in simple slow 6-8, for example. It's all because of that variable count whole note and the simple fraction of one half. So, so easy. I'm going to push pause on your thinking for a moment here to confirm what many of you are already thinking. This different way of teaching students the meaning of the bottom numbers of time signatures does not work at all for compound meter. You are absolutely right. Don't even try to figure it out. You'll turn your brain inside out and that's not good. I'll be doing a webinar sometime in the future titled Teaching compound meter is a piece of cake. That's an easy title to remember. Be on the lookout for it. So why is this different simple outside the box definition of the meaning of the bottom numbers of simple time signatures so important? Good question. I hope I have a good answer for you. Number one, both numbers represent what they have always been in students' minds. They are numbers. The number of counts in a measure and the number of counts in the whole number. The bottom number is not a kind of note, something that is very confusing for young minds to comprehend. It requires them to look at a number and think of it as a special note symbol. That's called abstract thinking, looking at one thing and having to think of it as something else. Generally speaking, young people can't do that. My research assistant, Dr. Google, tells me that abstract thinking does not start taking shape until early high school. Younger students are mainly concrete thinkers. To them, it is what it is. It's not a kind of a note, it's a number. This explains completely, to me at least, why students seem to have no trouble at all learning what the top numbers and time signatures tell them, but many of them have a great deal of difficulty with the bottom number. That's because we are expecting them to be able to do something that many of them are developmentally incapable of doing at their age. Instead of learning the value of just one note in a piece of music, the all important one count note, the students tell themselves the values of all the notes in a piece. Once the bottom number tells them how much the whole note is worth. If the whole note is eight counts, it's whole half quarter eight sixteenth, eight four two one a half. The sixteenth notes in this piece will be counted as one and two and and so forth. 
Thirdly, on the old system, if students, if students do come to understand that the bottom number of the time signature tells them that this is the kind of note that gets one count, a new and troublesome mathematical problem arises for younger students. And I keep referring to younger students because that's when we teach them this stuff, right? When they're elementary school, that's when we start teaching this. We need to, we need to think hard about the younger students and what they're going through when we talk, old people talk to them about uh, things like, um, you know, numbers having to look, numbers stand uh, being um, kinds of notes. The kind of note that gets one count is always somewhere in the middle of the family of notes whole, half, quarter, eighth, sixteenth. If the kind of note that gets one count is the quarter note, for example, it is right in the middle of the family of notes. The students have to figure out that the notes below the quarter note, the eighth and the sixteenth, are half as much. But the notes above the quarter note in the family of notes, the half note and the whole note, are twice as much. Two different mathematical functions required. I've talked to many math teachers who tell me that half as much and twice as much are confusing concepts for many young learners. With the bottom number simply being the value of the whole note, the problem of half as much and twice as much is eliminated. Whole half quarter eighth sixteenth, number half, 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 half. My textbook, Teaching Rhythm, New Strategies and Techniques for Success, talks about a study I conducted. Basically four highly experienced music teachers and 172 students in grades four through seven from four different school buildings were split into an even number of classes selected at random out of a box during an organizational meeting of the four teachers. Half of the classes would be taught the centuries old meaning of the bottom numbers of the time signatures identifying the kind of note that gets one count they would be the control group. The other half, the experimental group, would be taught that the bottom number is simply the value of the whole note. Even though the classes were chosen at random, the number of students in the two groups was fairly even. 89 students were in the control group and 83 were, excuse me, in the experimental group. All of the students would be first given an unannounced quiz to test their current knowledge of the meanings of the numbers and time signatures. There were 10 questions. Number one, three, four time, half note equals blank. Just questions like that. No answers required fraction, fractions because of the two classrooms of fourth graders. Not surprisingly, there were no perfect 10 out of 10 papers on the unannounced quiz. All four teachers were told at the organizational meeting that they were to teach three 10 minute lessons during one week devoted to the understanding of the numbers and time signatures to their classes that were to receive the traditional centuries old meaning of the top and bottom numbers of time signatures. Each of the teachers had an equal number of both control groups and experimental groups to teach. They would first teach the traditional way that time signatures had been taught. The bottom number identifies the kind of note that gets one count. Once that was accomplished, the students in those control groups were to then take a post-test so that the tests could be corrected and we could measure the degree of improvement between the surprise quiz and the post-test after three 10-minute lessons. Once all the control group classes had taken their post-tests, a second meeting was scheduled with just two items on the agenda. Number one, the teachers would bring their control group post-tests to be scored, and secondly, the teachers for the first time would hear the things I have shared with you, that the bottom number of the time signature is just a number, the number of counts in a whole note. That concept, by the way, was completely new to all four of the teachers. I had ascertained before the study even started, I purposely did not tell them anything at all about this alternate way of teaching time signatures until they had finished teaching their control classes. I did not want to take a chance on any of the new way being accidentally shared with the students. 
The experimental groups then had their three 10 minute lessons the following week and then took the post test to end the study. Final results, the control groups, autumn number identifies the kind of note that gets one count, 7% 10 out of 10 papers. Those students raised their grade from the unannounced quiz to the post test by almost one point out of 10, plus 0.94. So learning did occur, but I personally didn't think it was very much, considering that they had had three lessons on materials that they had very likely heard previously many times in their years in school. Remember, the students were from grades four through seven. Experimental group results, bottom number gives you the value of the whole note, an amazing 52% perfect papers. From the surprise quiz to the post-test, they raised their score plus 4.55 points out of 10, almost five out of 10. And remember, almost one third of the students in this study were fourth graders. To me, 7% perfect papers and 52% perfect papers are statistically significant numbers. And when I shared the results with the teachers at a final, final thank you get together, the fourth grade teacher said to everyone, you all should know that I didn't need 10 minutes on the third lesson with the new system. They were answering every question I asked them. So we just went on to something else after a couple of minutes. But that one of the elementary instrumental teachers said, same here. Why 52% perfect papers in less class time? In my view, there's a simple answer to that question. It is so much easier and so much more logical. It's easier to teach and it's easier to learn. I had a paper that I had written on this different way of teaching rhythm and time signatures long before I included it in any book. And I sent the paper to a good friend of mine who had left our school district and moved to Long Island where he had a long and successful number of years as a high school band director. I asked him to share my paper with a band director from there whom he really respected. When my friend came back to Ohio to visit one day. I asked him what the band director with whom he shared the paper thought about it. My friend told me, <clears throat> he thought you made everything too easy. I must say, I never really understood that response. It seems to me that's something that maybe should have been applauded rather than him or her thinking it was some kind of a problem. If he or she had told me to my face that I had made it too easy, I probably would have said, thank you. Everything depends upon the whole note. And how long is the whole note? The answer to that question, kids, is sitting right there on the page staring at you. Once students know how long the whole note is, which is what the bottom number of the time signature tells them, they know the family of notes, whole, half, quarter, and sixteenth. They essentially know how long all the notes are in a piece of music. And then they can figure it out in a way that is far easier than figuring out what kind of note gets one count. <clears throat> Instead of teaching students how to work their way through multiple confusing steps that include some abstract thinking, some notes being half as much while others are twice as much in order to learn the value of just one note, the all important one count note, why not show them a simple, easy and quick way to figure out the values of all the notes in a piece of music? We now have a choice. We can teach time signatures the easy way or the hard way. For the good of your students and for your own peace of mind, I hope you'll at least consider the easy way. I guess I'm asking you to consider joining this rhythm, rhythm revolution of mine. When you have some time to think about all of this, by the way, some of you will come up with the following. Wait just a minute, Mr. Newell, hold on. You want me to teach my students that two four means there are two counts in the measure and the whole note gets four counts? In 2-4, there's no such thing as a whole note. My reply, if there is no whole note, there is no system, period. What's a half note, half a banana? If you say that there's no such thing as a whole note, you're saying that a whole note equals zero. That makes a half note half of zero, which is zero. I repeat, theoretically, there has to be a whole note or there is no system at all. The science of rhythmic notation is based entirely 
upon the whole note. It is the whole note system, and the whole note has no value until there is a time signature. And that is why it is so very important that students truly understand the meanings of the numbers and time signatures. 52% of the students in our study compared to 7% demonstrated that they perfectly understood the meanings of the numbers and time signatures. In my view, students are much more likely to be able to figure out all of this on their own if both the top and the bottom numbers of the time signatures are, in fact, just numbers. The number of counts in a measure and the number of counts in the whole note. So simple. Here's an explanation of the question about 2-4 time and the idea that in 2-4 time, there is no such thing as a whole note. This is an explanation that I found that students clearly and easily understood. I said to them, in this piece of music written in 2-4 time, kids, you will not see a whole note anywhere. If you do, you will have caught the composer in an error. He or she has tried to cram four counts into a measure that will only hold two counts. But there's something the composer can do about that. If she or he or she really wants you to hear a four count sound right there. Anybody want to guess? Yes, Paul. Right. A half note in one measure tied to a half note in the next measure. Now there are only two counts in each measure, but the tie means that you will have to sing or play that sound for four counts, and the composer will have not made a mistake. A tie in music is like a plus sign in math. Two plus two equals four. Another reference to the science of mathematics being used in a music class. My students and I called this base four music music based on a whole note value of four. Cut time was base two music, music based on a whole note value of two. Simple six eight, so six eight was base eight music, music based on a whole note value of eight, therefore whole half quarter eighth, eight, four, two, one. That's why the eighth notes were one count when we were doing simple slow six eight earlier in the year, kids. During the time students are doing the cut time section of their lesson books, they need to be taught the true meaning of the cut time signature. The line drawn down through the common sign C does not mean that all the note values are cut in half. That is a shortcut that some teachers use to teach cut time, but it is unfortunately both an incorrect and an incomplete sentence. Teachers who tell their students that in cut time, all the notes are half as much are not finishing that sentence. They really are saying all the notes are half as much as they're supposed to be. That is preaching the old time gospel of the supremacy of 4-4 time. No note symbols have notes, numbers that they are supposed to be. Remember, if the whole note has no value, then no note has any value. There are some strange ideas about whole notes out there, by the way. I have actually seen in several published books this totally wrong and ridiculous statement. The whole note gets its name from the fact that it fills a whole measure. I might have seen that kind of thing in some of those books that say they are written for dummies, maybe written by dummies, I don't know. Well, it's quite clever. Whole note, whole note, measure. They go together and it's easy to memorize, but with rhythm, we are not promoting memorizing. We are promoting analyzing. In 2-4 time, the note that fills a whole measure is a half note. So should students start calling a half note a whole note when they get a piece of two music in 2-4 time? I mean, it fills a whole measure, right? Talk about confusion. Talk about something that makes no sense. I once heard a very fine teacher whom I know personally remind his middle school students who were about to start rehearsing their piece written in cut time. He said, now remember kids, this piece is in cut time, so the quarter notes are eighth notes. Huh? Quarter notes can never be eighth notes. Quarter notes can be half a count, yes, but they can never become eighth notes. We can't change the names of note symbols just because we changed time signatures. 
I might have said this before, it is statements like these that make something so simple become so confusing for students. And remember, this was a fine teacher who told his students that quarter notes were eighth notes. He simply didn't understand the science of rhythmic notation. He was unwittingly promoting a crazy, mind-boggling idea that in cut time, quarter notes are eighth notes. That's what he told his middle school kids. And so, of course, that means that half notes are quarter notes and whole notes are half notes. And eighth notes are sixteenth notes. And now I'm completely confused myself. 100% totally unscientific. How can something so simple be so difficult to teach? By abandoning the word science in the statement, music's both an art and a science. Before my students understood the basic science of the rhythmic notation in the pieces we were working on, I had to often do something like the following. The third clarinets were not getting their rhythm measure 27. While I was working with just those four students, the other 65 students were sitting in the room doing nothing except getting bored or perhaps getting in trouble. When the thirds finally got their rhythm in that measure, I would ask to hear the seconds in that same measure because their rhythm was different from the thirds. After the seconds got their part, I would have the seconds and thirds together. And then I would be forced to say, no, 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 thirds, you don't have what the seconds have. Let's hear your part again. And we'd go around that same block again. It would fall apart again when I put them together. And then feeling like I was out of options, I would say the dumbest thing you could possibly say in a music room. Thirds, don't listen to the seconds. I'm in a music room and saying, don't listen. What a genius. And what a waste of time, especially for the students not participating. If that kind of thing happens on a regular basis, and it does because other sections also need help, that's when students start thinking about dropping the class. Plus, that is often when classroom management problems start. Student boredom can be a significant reason for dropouts in any program, and we must retain our students. Math teachers get an automatic bunch of students every year. We have to keep ours to build a program. And I must say this, we are in charge of the boredom factor in our classrooms. Once my students fully understood how rhythmic notation works, instead of the scenario of hearing first the thirds and then the seconds a couple of times, and then of course, having to include the first and finally hearing all of the clarinets together, that kind of rehearsing was over. Now I could simply say four words. Clarinets measure 27, look at the rhythm four words. They would look at the rhythm and fix it themselves. They would give me this knowing nod. Oh, sorry. Four words worked just like magic, it seemed. That was a five-second stop in the rehearsal instead of a five-minute one. That's when I started thinking of those four-word statements as my four magic words. More about the four magic words coming up very shortly. They took on enormous power and I expanded their use greatly. Solving the rhythm problem changed everything about my job. If I had not solved my rhythm problem, I would not have written a single book because I wouldn't have had much to say. Once I solved my rhythm problem, everything changed for me, absolutely everything. And that's why I am so committed to sharing this with anyone who will listen to what I have to say. It was a beautiful sunny morning early in September, the first year I retired from my 30 years of public school teaching. I was sitting on the deck and thinking, you know, this retirement thing is really nice. Since I retired, I've been getting up every morning at the crack of 10, thinking about what I want, might want to do that day, and oftentimes coming to a conclusion something like this, nah, it'll still need to be painted next month. Then, as a newly retired gentleman, though, I got serious and I started reminiscing about my 30 year career in the public schools and actually missing not being there anymore. The first thing I thought about was how fortunate it was that I had somehow figured out the classroom management part of the job. It was the thing that concerned me the most as a first year teacher. I then heard myself talking to myself. 
Well, of course you had good classroom management, you, you moron. That's how I talk to myself, it gets my attention. Excuse me, your students had no reason, no time, and no desire to do anything except to learn and to do music. Then I started reviewing in my mind what a rehearsal looked like on a typical day. Let me, as briefly as I can, describe a typical rehearsal for you once I had solved my rhythm teaching problem. Once again, I remind you that this example will be from my band experience, but it works for all of us. Every day, the students would talk, would walk into the room, get their folders, find their seats, and put their music in rehearsal order by looking at the rehearsal agenda as written on the chalkboard. Then they would individually start to warm up. They warmed up in a very mature and serious fashion because they had been taught a unit of study on warming up. The students knew how important it was for everyone to warm up. A band can't tune if half the wind instruments are warm and the others are cold. Everyone knew what a good warm up consisted of and they knew to keep one eye on the clock because the teacher would step onto the podium at 9.06 a.m. every morning. And when he did, all playing and talking would stop immediately. There would be instant silence in the room. After the full group warm up directed by the teacher, he would step off the podium in order not to be in the way of any student's view. As he said, can anyone find a mistake in today's board rhythm? There would already have been written on the board a rhythm of anywhere from one to several measures in length. The students knew that on a, any given day, there may or may not be some mistakes in the day's board rhythm. The students would all seriously look at the rhythm. They loved finding mistakes their teacher had made. Students who found mistakes were tasked with fixing them in the simplest way possible. Some days the mistakes would be large, too many counts in a measure. Sometimes it's small, a forgotten dot after a note. Once all the mistakes were corrected by the students, or if there were no mistakes in the rhythm to begin with, the whole ensemble would play the rhythm always on the concert B-flat major scale. Why always the B-flat major scale? It was the band's automatic scale. They could figuratively play it in their sleep. That allowed them to concentrate on only one thing, the rhythm. It did not matter how many measures were there were on the rhythm. The students knew that they changed pitches on every bar line and they stopped playing when they reached the octave, no matter which measure they were on. After that, on some days, teacher would take an eraser and erase various elements in a measure or two or three. Individual students were asked to tell the teacher something different to put back in the erased spots, demonstrating that they understood how many counts were in the full measure, how many counts had been erased, and what to insert to fill the space accurately. As the year progressed, the board rhythms became more complex, changing readers, a 4-4 four, four measure followed by a compound 6-8 measure, perhaps. When completely corrected, the group would play the scale and move on to a different activity, once again with no break, no time to talk. Classroom management had been taken over with music making. As Dr. Tim Lotzenheiser said in his endorsement on the back cover of the classroom management book, Quote, music takes over the management in the classroom. Management through music, what could be better? Closed quote. After the warm-up activities were completed without a break, a two-part rehearsal would begin. The first part of every rehearsal was known as the lesson part. The lesson part. The lesson part of every rehearsal involved every student participating in various units of study. Everything was played in unison so that everyone was participating in the learning. All the percussion students played mallets, two players to an instrument if the lesson involved pitched music. What kinds of lessons were taught? The order of sharps and flats and key signatures, new rhythms, dynamics, articulations, and many more musical skills were learned by everyone in the band by way of units of study in the lesson parts 
of rehearsals. The first lesson of the day was very often rhythm. We did rhythm work every day for the entire year. A rhythm a day keeps the band at play. A rhythm a day keeps the strings a stringing. A rhythm a day keeps the singers a singing. Where did these new rhythms and the other ideas for new units of study come from? From the scores sitting on the teacher's desk waiting to be handed out later in the year. If there was a piece that had a lot of syncopation in it, for example, and if the ensemble had not, had not much experience with that rhythm, Syncopation became a new unit of study. The unit of study was started well before the piece would be handed out. <clears throat> Until the skill of syncopation was mastered, that piece of music stayed on the teacher's desk. Once the students had mastered syncopation, the new piece of literature would be handed out and would become a piece of literature in the literature part of the rehearsal, the second part of the rehearsal. On the day the new piece would be sight read, the teacher would ask, does anyone see anything in this piece that they don't recognize? Very seldom did anyone see something that they didn't recognize. Would there be, would there be some mistakes made during the sight reading? Yes, of course, but not ones that would stop the entire rehearsal. Rhythm errors would almost always be quickly taken care of by four words. Look at the rhythm. Errors would be fixed by four words. Look at the key. Look at the dynamics. Think about the style. Are you in tune and so forth? The students could sight read the pieces set before them because they had the precise skills that the pieces required. And please understand that the rhythm units of study did not feature exact rhythms from the piece. No memorization was involved or necessary. The unit of study was a general study of syncopation. From the very beginning, the syncopation was perform performed with a gentle emphasis on the syncopated note. Da, 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 da. When any particular skills were needed, they could simply be withdrawn from the ensemble's buildup of skills. The withdrawal slip for withdrawing those skills from a skills bank are four simple magic words. Once the lesson part of the two-part rehearsal was over for the day, there was a one or two minute break and then into the literature part of the class. I'm sure you're all wondering how we ever had enough time to prepare for concerts. It was not that difficult at all. The secret, I never handed out a piece of concert music that had a basic skill in it that the students had not mastered in the lesson parts of previous daily rehearsals. The pieces of music that I handed out during the literature parts of the rehearsals were not full of a bunch of skills that they had to learn. The literature part of every rehearsal was 100% for making music, not for learning skills. Every piece as a piece of musical literature from day one. Every piece was a piece of musical literature from day one. They had already mastered the skills needed in the piece of literature they were rehearsing. A skill that perhaps needed to be reviewed became a part of the next rehearsal's lesson part of that rehearsal. The literature part of every rehearsal was devoted 100% to turning the notes on the page into music. I can tell you honestly that my students could sight read anything I put in front of them. Rehearsals were very fast paced. In my mind, all of those mastered skills throughout the year had been deposited into the ensemble's skills bank. Those skills were available for withdrawal at any time. My repertoire of four magic words were greatly expanded. What started out simply as look at the rhythm morphed into think about the style, look at the key, who has the melody, look at the dynamics and many more. I no longer said things like, measure 49, you're too loud. When we say things like that, who's doing the thinking? The director. The only thing the students have to do is react and oftentimes to forget it the next time. But when we say, look at the dynamics and the students look at them and they say to themselves, ooh, we're too loud. They are far more likely to remember that. I am personally convinced that students enjoy classes in which they are challenged to do more thinking than listening. 
When the director starts them up again at measure 49 and it is softer, he or she knows that they looked at the dynamic marking, they thought about it, they understood, they told themselves they were too loud, and they will be more likely to remember it. You may very well be thinking, my students would hate all those lessons during the first part of every rehearsal. Many of them just wanted to play their instruments and sing. They signed up for band and orchestra and choir to get away from all that regular school kind of book learning. To my delight and surprise, I found out otherwise. My wife and I were sitting in the hot tub one evening, probably in about the middle of my 30 years in the public schools. We were having a casual conversation. She asked me, how are things going in school? I said, fine, I'm gonna be observed by my supervisor on Friday. She asked me how I thought that would go. I said, no problem. I've known about it for a week, so I'll plan a very safe rehearsal, one that I know that will go very, very well. About the middle of the following week, she applies, apologized for having forgotten to ask me how my observation went last Friday. I told her it went fine, just like it was planned. As a matter of fact, I had just that day gotten a very nice write-up on it that would be put into my permanent file. She said, well, you don't seem very excited about that. I told her there was nothing to be excited about. To me, it was just teacher show and tell day. She asked me, well, what would make you excited? Professionally, she was a mental health therapist and was really good at digging into things. I answered immediately, I would give anything to know what my students thought of my class. If I could just somehow know their personal innermost thoughts about my class, I would be so excited. She nonchalantly replied, well, I can help you with that. I said, you can? She told me about a psychologist who developed a questionnaire that was a list of sentence stems sentences that were just started. And the, the uh, new patients would have to fill those out before they saw the psychologist for the first time. Perhaps sentence stems like, I feel happiest when, I feel saddest when, if I could change one thing about myself, and so forth. I don't think those were the actual ones on his questionnaire, but you get the idea. I thought, wow, how much he would know about his new patients before he ever met them. I was so excited. I went to school within a couple of days with my own sentence completion questionnaire for my band. I ended the class that day 15 minutes early, had them put their instruments away and re-enter the room, sit in their assigned seats and have a pen or pencil with them. I made sure that they understood that these were to be anonymous. If you want to know how you are doing in your classroom, you need to ask the only people who really know that what it's like to be in your classroom. So I know you have been wondering, what do students think about performance classes based on the two-part rehearsal format? Let's ask them. I had my developed my own sentence completion blank. I still have in my possession 54 anonymous sentence completion surveys filled out by seventh and eighth graders. I wish I had kept many more of them. On the survey, there were a total of 10 sentences that I had started. The students need to finish each sentence stem with an honest, true feeling of their own on the subject. Sentence stems such as, in band we always, in band whenever, the best thing about band and so forth. The student responses are quite revealing, especially in the number of references students made about the work involved and the knowledge they gained, uh, they gained by being in the class. On the 64 uh, surveys, in these surveys, students could and did say anything. I usually paired my sentences. The best thing about this class would be followed by the worst thing about this class. Here are a couple of memorable ones. I know this was a young lady in the class but I don't know who she was. The best thing about band is I get to see this boy I really like. The worst thing about band is that I don't know if he likes me or not. <laughs> Middle school kids, you gotta love him. Somebody has to. One I personally will never forget. I think this student was referring to my sense of humor. Mr. Newell is not your normal kind of guy, but it's a nice difference. Students, by the way, love a funny, way teach, a funny teacher. I feel sure 
that it does have a positive effect on retaining students. If you have a sense of humor, use it. If you don't have a sense of humor, go get one. This is what these 54 middle school band students had to say about having to learn all these academic-like lessons in a music performance class. The sentence stem was every day in band. We learn something that is interesting and not boring like some other subjects. Every day in band, we learn something new and still have fun. Three students said that. Every day in band, we do serious work. Every day in band, we understand more about music. Every day we learn new things, 10 students. In band, we always have fun and learn a lot of things, five students. Every day in band, we learn new things, two students. In band, we never go a day without learning something, two students. In band, we never leave the room without knowing something new. The best thing about band is learning all that we do. The best thing about band is we learn many things other people don't know, and as we have fun learning new stuff, two students. Being in this class is a lot of fun, but takes a lot of hard work. I like that one. Being in this class makes me want to learn. Being in this help in this class helps me to learn more about music. Being in this class is never boring. Great with four exclamation points. Being in this class, class helps me a lot with a lot of things. I learn a lot of, too. Our music teacher almost never gives us something easy to learn. I like that. Our teacher almost always has a good time helping us learn. Music. The final one was just one word. Music is a hard subject, but you learn what it's about and what different things mean. Finally, a few of the major benefits of this two-part rehearsal format. Literally, students can learn twice as much music in half the time using the two-part rehearsal format, and the eventual performance of the piece will be more musical because that's what the piece has always been to the students, a piece of music. It's never been a bunch of problems to solve. Essentially, the problems were solved before the music was seen. Secondly, there is no doubt that getting students to practice outside of the rehearsal is more difficult than it has ever been. Many students are legitimately too busy to put in the kind of individual practice time their teachers would like to require of them. More students than ever are involved in sports, have after school and evening jobs, so many little screens to watch and so forth. The, lessons part, the lesson parts of rehearsals can help to solve these and other related problems. From the first sounds of the class warm up through to the conclusion of the day's various units of study, 100% of the students are experiencing a model practice session designed to address the specific needs of that ensemble and led by an expert. Even on days when students legitimately have no time to practice, their teachers can know that they have had a thorough, professionally directed workout. The lesson parts of rehearsals lay the foundations for the making of music. I thank you so much for your time. Carl, you're on, buddy. There he is. <laughs> Another wonderful day. Thank you so much, David. Um, you're welcome. Uh, at this time, uh, uh, we'd welcome any questions that you'd like to ask. Um, we're going to take those through the Q&A and the chat function, if you'd like to, to ask through one of those channels. Um, at the same time, I'm going to go ahead and put um, the information about our 25% discount. Uh, which includes the Simple Rhythmetician, Classic Christmas Carols for Band, uh, Classroom Management, and Teaching Rhythm. So that's going to go up in the chat here in just a sec. And that info is in there. Um, if you want to go ahead and copy uh, the link that's included there, that'll take you to a landing page that includes all of the products that are available for that discount and our promo code that's only available through kjos.com is rhythm21. That can all be all uppercase or all lowercase, but nothing in between. So rhythm21 is the, the promo code for that. Um, we also have a YouTube channel that will eventually put uh, a recording for yesterday's event and today's event. So the part one and the part two for the Rhythm Revolution, Not Your Grandfather's Way of Teaching Rhythm, uh, will be up on that YouTube channel. Hopefully within the next couple of weeks, we'll send out a notification about that once they are ready, but you're welcome to check back periodically and see if it's available 
on the YouTube channel and there is that. Uh, one more quick note before we hop into questions too. Um, I'm gonna put our company contact information in the chat as well. So if you have any questions after this or you would like uh, to contact us for any reason, um, we're happy to, to um, uh, take those questions or, or uh, requests at email at kjos.com. Uh, so those three things are in the chat right now. Uh, we do have some questions here, David, or at least one so far. Um, when introducing quarter notes and basic rhythms, do you use the system of I play, you play, and I say, you say? We can get a little more information on that. If it's mm, I'm, I'm not sure I completely understand. Um, my turn, your turn, I think that person might be referring to, you know, I would go do, 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 and they would reply, would reply do, 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 and then I would say one, two, three, and four, and they would echo that. That might be what the person's talking about. I'm not sure. Uh, speaking of absolute beginners in uh, beginning band, um, Mr. Sandberg, did, did, um, did Mr. Newell's example explain what you were uh, looking for there? We'll wait for a, a reply on that and hop over to another question in the Q&A here. Um, thank you, Mr. Newell. What is the best way to teach rhythm off the instruments? The masks may make it hard to have students uh, bubble or say bum bum because I can't see them. So this is kind of a remote question. Remote I was, I was telling time. I was telling Carl before we started this, I feel so bad for you people having to teach instrumental music, for instance, uh, in this COVID time. I just don't I don't know how you do it. God bless you. Uh, <laughs> we have a question from an anonymous attendee, if I were to get a book for singers to use, which would I select? Would that be one of the textbooks, David, for, for vocal classrooms? Or um, well, every, every teacher has to teach rhythm, I would say, uh, the rhythm book. And every teacher has to have good management, the management book. And I think those are both discounted, aren't they, Carl? They are. Yeah. Um, do you think that the, the simple rhythmetician series would work for vocal students as well, or is that Absolutely. a bit of a stretch? Okay. Absolutely. And if they registered for this, didn't they get a packet that has the simple rhythmation in it? That's true. Thanks for bringing that up, David. Um, that is something that, that we do ask that our attendees request. So if you haven't requested that, that complimentary packet, um, uh, you're welcome to contact us via that email that I provided. We do need your preferred shipping address, and we do need you to mention this specific event. So the Rhythm Revolution or David Newell, that way we know uh, what packet you're requesting. But I will put the contact information up in there as well. I believe we probably haven't uh, sent a packet to everybody who's in um, this particular session, but uh, in the case that we haven't, then, then please contact us and we'll make sure that we do that. <clears throat> Um, Bob Brainerd is asking, what's the name of the Facebook group again, the middle school directors? Uh, middle school band directors. There's, there's no charge, you just, it's a Facebook group and it's very active. And from the reading I do, I'm sure there are orchestra teachers in there, choir teachers. You don't have to be a middle school band director. Um, Matthew V says, thank you, David. I was wondering how you approach compound six, eight meter. And you mentioned too, during our session that we'll do a follow-up uh, webinar, which will probably happen at the beginning of the year on um, compound meter. But um, is there a quick, quick version we could? Um, well, an hour. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, uh, stay no, tuned for no, that, com Matthew. Compound but... meter is essentially very confusing. You know, I mean, the sounds are divided into thirds and sixths. We don't have third notes. We don't have sixth notes. We have to somehow figure out how to use eighth notes for notes that are a third of a count. 
it's essentially confusing, but like I said, if you remember, the title of that session is gonna be teaching compound meter is a piece of cake. I'd rather teach compound meter to your students than 4-4 any day. It is such a piece of cake and kids love it. So Matthew, stay tuned for that notification. We're gonna go really in depth um, uh, on compound meter probably at the beginning of 2022. So, so that'll be coming up uh, pretty soon here. Excuse me. Oh, it hasn't come yet. Okay. So yeah, some of the packets um, may still uh, be arriving. Uh, so do ask for your patience on those, um, but we will ship uh, out to any requests. Um, trying to see if I can circle back to... Uh, well, Jeff Sandberg also uh, is asking, of all three of your texts, the rehearsal has a special place in my teaching. Have you considered writing an expanded version of that that goes over other units of study? Jeff, um, I recognize your name. I know you've bought a lot of my stuff and bought into my ideas. Um, and I appreciate that very much. I'm getting rather old. <laughs> I don't, I have one other book in mind, but it's, it is on compound meter, but I really appreciate your support over the years, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you everybody for tuning in, by the way. <clears throat> Let's see. I think that we've kind of gone over everything again. Uh, apologies if we didn't get to you, but I'll put our contact email in there one more time. Um, if you have some follow-up questions, then please let us know. Um, I'm going to put the special promotional offer in one more time as well. Uh, so please feel free to take advantage of that. That is under the promo code RHYTHM21. We really appreciate everybody uh, coming out today and, and joining us for this session. Um, thank you, David, so much. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again uh, uh, when we have the opportunity uh, to do a couple more sessions. Uh, compound meter is, is on the agenda. And I think that we'll do the Unison Clinic too, uh, which has been a fan favorite. So um, stay tuned. We'll also let you know about the YouTube videos once they're available. Hope everybody has a great evening. Thank you, everybody.